reading the book of Isaiah can be compared to listening to one of the great symphonies by Beethoven. Very often the themes are interwoven the same way that musical themes are interwoven in these symphonies. And it may be difficult to, to pinpoint exactly where does the new section begin? Where does the former one end? But, amazing. You are able to enjoy reading like you are able to enjoy listening, even though you may not be able to analyze exactly what is going on. Welcome to another tidbit from the book of Isaiah. And this introduction is in part because I find that the chapters we're going to speak about, chapters 40 to 48, belong to the most beautiful part of the Bible. And I've often read it simply to be impressed with and to enjoy the promises, the poetry, without being able to exactly analyze. Let's do a little analysis nevertheless. Most commentators agree that chapters 40 to 48 somehow composes a unit. That something new begins in chapter 49, where you have the servant of the Lord as a suffering servant taking up the theme of servanthood from the previous chapters. There is a servant, Jacob, the people. There's another servant, Cyrus, the king who liberated the Israelites from their exile in Babylon. And then you have a hint of the servant that is to be described in more detail in the following chapters, the Messiah. But 40 and 40, to 48 belong together. And they are as much Hebrew literature, most likely structured, like a chiasm, a reversed mirror. The first chapter opens with good news for Jerusalem. God will come to his temple in Jerusalem. He will walk through the desert. There's a path prepared for a return. But the section closes, not with the good news to Jerusalem, but in 47 and 48 with bad news for Babylon. You have the two antagonists of the whole book, Babylon and Jerusalem. And as you from each side of this structure, this section, move in, you will find first the emphasis on God as superior to the idols, the one who is able to call. King Cyrus from the east, and he is superior to idol. He will raise uh, Cyrus as, as he raises a bird to fly, a bird of prey. As you move closer to the middle, you have a challenge to all the idols. They cannot protect, predict the future, and they don't create. They are but dead. They are actually made by humans. And that leads to one of the central themes in the book. It's very often in this part of the book stated as a court contest. The idols, the nations, the people are invited to a court session. That is, come for justice and judgment. Chapter 41 begins like this, Be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. In verse 21, still chapter 41, Present your case, says the Lord. Set forth your arguments, says Jacob's king. Bring in your idols to tell us what is going to happen, and so on. So it is in a court setting. Show your credentials. And then there are two major differences that are described between God as and the idols. The idols cannot foretell the future. The idols cannot create. The main reason for that is, of course, that the idols do not exist. They don't live truly. They are made themselves by humans. And you have some extremely 
satirical and quite funny ex uh, descriptions of that uh, in the first one is short in chapter 41 they approach and come forward he helps the other and says to his brother be strong the craftsman encourages the goldsmith he who smooths with the hammer spurs on him who strikes the anvil he says of the welding it is good he nails down the idol so it will not topple and in a very long description in chapter 44 I think it is you have from verse 9 to 20 this this uh, very funny way of speaking about the idols all who make idols are nothing of course and the idols are nothing as well and then you have the tree that is cut up and all is prepared and it's burned in the oven and so on and then people bow down and say this is my God this is so ironic God on the contrary the God of Isaiah the God of the Bible is alive and therefore he can foretell the future because he has created everything he is independent of what is present your case we read in 41.21. This is a theme you can find as you go through these chapters. Tell us what the former things were so that we can consider them and know their final outcome. Or declare us the things to come to tell us what the future holds so that we may know you are God's. Point is, by presenting his prophecies by looking at the fulfillment of the prophecies the one about Cyrus the Persian king is one example God has shown he is a God who can see the end from the beginning he is the God who has created he is outside and independent of what is created Lord of history Lord of nature the creation theme is mentioned several times this is what the Lord says 20 verse 18 in chapter 45 he who created the heavens he is God he who fashioned and made the earth he founded it he did not create it to be empty but formed it to be inhabited so you have this constant reminder of who created God created by his word out of nothing these are major themes. Now this is expressed, or these themes are expressed in ways that are reused in the New Testament. And let me point to a couple of these essential expressions that you find also in the New Testament, particularly used by or about Jesus Christ. One is the term, God is the first and the last. In chapter 44, verse 6, it is said this way. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. In chapter 48, verse 12. Listen to me, O Jacob, Israel, whom I have called. I am he, I am the first, and I am the last. And then it continues with the emphasis on creation. My own hand lay the foundations of the earth. But the expression, I am the first and the last, is one that is quoted by Jesus when he visited John on Patmos. It's quoted in Revelation 1. 17 and it is then quoted again later in at the end of the book of revelation in revelation 22 13. jesus identifies himself on patmos with the god of the old testament the god of isaiah the god yahweh there is another expression in which is unique in the book of isaiah which is also reused in the New Testament. We already read it in English translation from New International Version. 
Isaiah 41, verse 4, I, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am He. We notice that maybe also in 48, 12, I am He. Behind that expression is a Hebrew expression, Anihu. I am the one, or it is me, variously translated. Ani is a personal pronoun. Who is in another pronoun, third person, I am he. This is the origin of the repeated self-declaration by Jesus, I am the one I am, John thirteen thirty nine. Before Abraham, I am, that is uh, we also in, in uh, the Gospel of John, where most of these are taken from, that is 858. I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the good shepherd. Now here, I am the one, it is me. There is no other God besides me. In the New Testament, Jesus identifies himself and the Gospel writers identified Jesus with this God of the Old Testament, the great I Am. Now, let's look at some of the other themes before we close for this time. As you read through these chapters and also other chapters in Isaiah, you will notice there's a constant reminder of the exodus from Egypt. There's a new exodus, new deliverance. It's always compared with this wandering through the desert, through the wilderness. And that is the theme, of course, that you find also in the New Testament. And then... This, uh, this section, this unit, chapter 40 to 48, ends on a note of peace. Now, when you read and come to the end and you read the last verse, verse 22 and 48, it looks a little negative. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. But if you have read just a few verses earlier in verse 18 you find if only you had paid attention to my commands your peace would have been like a river your righteousness like the waves of the sea and very likely you will recognize here the inspiration for a well-known gospel song when peace like a river and then it's well with my soul. So what you have here is an invitation to Israel. It is an appeal. There are two ways to go. You can follow the Lord. He has paved the way through the desert. And then you will have peace. If you don't, you won't have any peace. So as often in the Bible, the two endings, because the book is written and presented as an appeal. On the one side, an invitation. On the other side, a warning. Listen to God's invitation and you will find peace. Thank you for listening to this tidbit and I look forward to See you again when we move on into the next section and study the suffering of the servant, the Messiah. Thank you.